Welcome, sir, to Smiley's. Grab a glass of tusk milk and pull up a chair. We are going to talk about the Greysoul, specifically the three leaders, Destrian Carnatas, Mortal Sword Regalia, and Shield Daniel Covian. Spoilers are mostly limited, almost entirely limited, to memories of Ice only. I would like to add a small disclaimer to our listeners. The thing is, I suggested this topic because I just wanted to admire and gloat over these absolute badasses. But once we started researching, we were able to see that they are not as perfect or noble or moral people as we first thought. And for this, I just want to thank my co-host, Lee. You're welcome. Who has destroyed my biggest crush in these three books. Yeah? Do you have anything to say for yourself, Lee? <laughs> um, I think the rest of this episode is me talking about this. So whatever I have to say about myself will be greatly elaborated upon throughout the rest of this episode. So. Okay, so since we are at Memories of Ice, uh, can you just, you know, this is the first time we see these three terms. The Mortal Sword, the Destroyer, and Shield Anvil. You want to like help tell me uh, what are the definitions or how do you see these rules? The definitions. I don't think there's any definition in the Mars and Magic world, but I'll try my best. So yeah, I think the easiest one to start off with is the Mortal Sword. It's fairly ob- obvious, self-explanatory. It is obviously the God's chosen warrior, the primary well sword, right? The fighter through which the God. It's not necessarily that the God challen- channels their power through their Mortal Sword, but they are either the most devout, the most capable, the strongest warrior in service of a certain god. Now, the other two roles are a bit more complicated, but uh, the Destrian is also relatively simple to explain. It is, in general, the highest priest in the... the highest ranked priest, rather, in the worship of the god. Who does the ranking is a great question. In general, it's supposed to be the god, but uh, especially Memories of Ice, which is not always the case, because, for instance, the priest in Capistan, Rathfenna, considers himself to be the Destrian, or of a rank equal to Destrian. Whereas Carnaras is the actual destriant. So who does the choosing, who is actually the destriant and who isn't, isn't exactly elaborated upon. And um, the Shield Anvil is probably the most complicated role to explain. Hitkovian describes his own role as both a scholar and a warrior. So they are in charge of strategy and tactics, presumably. They conduct research on their faith, their religion, the battle tactics of other peoples, other cultures, diplomacy, polypo- they basically the ones that do everything. <laughs> Or thereabouts. And also, they are uniquely situated in that they are able to embrace and uh, take upon themselves negative emotions or some such. Emotions, memories, or in general what Ikovian calls the pain of others. And then, ideally, deliver that pain onto a god. In this case, Fenner. So, Mora, do you have anything to add? Yeah, right. Uh, so, so, when you say shield anvil, uh, you know that he's taking up the grief of the worshippers and delivering it to his god. Right, but uh, there are. I've seen some discussions saying that you know he is supposed to be protector of the god. You know the other way, which you know it doesn't make sense to me because this is the way it has to go, right? From worshippers mm-hmm. to god, yes, through the shield anvil. So, and you know the more I think about him, I feel like he's you know sort of the therapist there because he takes care of their PTSD and he also you know tries to learn about people's motivations and all. That's his role when he's uh, actually helping them come up with strategies. His role is also to provide like the psychological basis of their allies and their enemies and all. There are some passages like that. So uh, among these three, what I find interesting is in any religious order, you would expect the high priest to be the highest ranked person, right? And actually, when I read the book, this is what I thought. I thought Karnadas is the topmost guy, then followed by Brukalian and then Itkovian. But yeah, I saw the interview where uh, Erickson keeps saying that it's mortal sword destroyed and then shield anvil, which, you know, because they are a war order, it sort of makes sense, you know? What do you think about that? So, I would like to touch upon a few things. First of all, you mentioned that the shield anvil is meant to serve as a protector of the god. I don't think that's the case. I think... Well, I think it's yeah. technically correct, but misleading. So, he acts as a protector of the god in the sense that he is a conduit, a vessel, for the grief of everyone. Because, for instance, um, we saw in the Tav Gates that Herboric, through certain, a certain mechanism that we don't know yet, pulled down his god, and now his god is vulnerable in the mortal realm. Yeah. Uh, that obviously has some modifications for the Kovian and the others that we'll get to later. The point I'm trying to make is, in general, worshippers have a certain amount of power over their gods via their worship. If a god allowed themselves just take on all of those emotions, prayers, worship, all of that, there is a very good chance that they would be overwhelmed. And maybe not weakened, per se, but they would not be able to respond in the same way that they are now when they have someone to concentrate all of that and then pass it on through in more controlled manner. Which is also part of the problem that Itkovian can't deliver all of that now, because when it's gone. But in the past, ideally, he would be able to do that. Just take on, through the course of a day, a week, a month, a big battle, a siege, whatever. And then, in his alone time, his spare time, when he's praying or whatever, go to go deliver that to his god in a more controlled manner that does not overwhelm the god. So, the god can deliver um, 
followers, to starvation, and their fo- his followers will not destroy the god in turn by overwhelming him. That's one thing. The other thing is, I think in general, uh, I haven't watched the Ericsson video that you mentioned, so I don't actually know, but it's my understanding that it's more on a case by case basis on who has overall command. Since the Grey Swords are a religious organization, but they're also mercenaries, obviously, Brookalion would be top dog because he's a top boar, I guess. Yeah, that sounds better. <laughs> Brookalion would be the top guy because he is the mortal sword and thus the most capable warrior of all of them. In an organization that is more religiously aspected, like, I don't know, a temple, they have no need for the mortal sword to be above a detriment because they're not actively fighting anybody. So, um, you mentioned also that the Copian psychoanalyzes or whatever, and uh, gives profiles of the psychological at- at- attitude of uh, their allies. I don't have much to say about that because I don't understand it, but the point is that all of the shield anvil is much too wide to be encapsulated in a single, he's a strategist, or he's a scholar, or he's a warrior. He's a lot of things. Yeah. So, um, the organization of the Great Sword is a bit difficult to understand. They are a complement of Ellen mostly soldiers from Ellingarth. They also include among populations. They are numbered about 7,000. And they're a mercenary company that actually costs a lot, surprisingly enough. Yeah. So would you like to touch upon the situation on Kapistan and uh, their complement and what happens before we get deeper into the weeds? So uh, the city of Kapistan. So uh, it is ruled by a prince and also a mast council, right? The mast council is full of uh, priest. various mm. priests, including Rath Fenner, uh, who these guys worship. But the prince apparently has not much rights within the city because the master council keeps overriding him. So out of his personal, I don't know, personal money or something, he has hired these grace words, right? Mm-hmm. So initially, I think in book one, when we learn about the grace words through the bridge burners and all that, we think that they are just some mercenary company and they're just going to up and disappear as soon as the Panian army comes in. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know, until we meet them and we see that they are extremely, like, you know, religiously very honorable people. So only then we realize that yeah they're going to actually do something and not just disappear when the work gets tough. So so what we learn is Kapustan is being defended by the Grace Woods. There is also a small army of the temple people themselves. I think it's called the Gitrath or something. And once inside Kapustan, these guys have started recruiting people from within, mainly women who were till now not allowed to join the Kapustan army, right? So they have like twelve hundred more recruits, and each of their recruit or each of each soldier inside the Grace Wood is a disciple and they're all taught uh, like they're within the religion and they're also taught some you know they have they're able to draw healing powers from the restraint and each of them are able to provide healing on the field you know that makes them extremely extremely efficient as an army right so um well they're also yeah they're also referred to as sir regardless of gender everyone is sir uh, gender and rank. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, because it go in, and uh, regardless of gender and rank, because it go in refers to Brickalian as sir, not mortal sword the lock. And on the contrary, he also ref- yeah. uh, refers to recruits as sir. They're very, yeah. on one hand, they are uh, hierarchy because they're in a religious organization. On the other hand, they're all basically equal. And, uh, excuse the pun, but they're brethren, basically. They're all a family of sorts. <laughs> not quite, but there is that sort of uh, equality yeah. among everyone. Because everyone's equal before Fenner, because, you know, he's above us all. So. No, there is something. Yes, sorry, I'll just interrupt. There is a line where it says, you know, Fenner doesn't make arbitrary exclusions. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's the type of society probably. Uh, yeah. mm, which raises the question of what exactly is Fenner and what does his worship entail? We'll get to that in a minute because uh, yeah. we're not quite done yet. And I don't want to depress Mora quite yet yeah. before we get to the juicy stuff. <laughs> so. <laughs> Would you kindly carry on with uh, the actions of our uh, Hitler character, the guys we're discussing? Uh, these guys, Brucalian and all. You want me to like cover the entire book? What uh, happens? Well, there's obviously Brucalians. Well, there's a Brucalian scene with Gethel. There's uh, the siege, obviously. There's okay. mostly the siege. You want me to talk about Brucalian? I will happily talk about Brucalian I mean, all day. Go on. What could it help? Yeah, so, no, no, it's... He's a mortal sword. And, yeah, actually, uh, when this chapter first began, right? Uh, when we were first introduced to the Grey Swords, uh, as usual, I was misled. I thought, yeah, it's Brucalian's story. And he's the one <laughs> we are going to follow throughout. And, you know, my friend asked me, what do you think about uh, Itkovian? And I was like, who? Who Itkovian? Yeah, he just left. He just did something. Yeah, he had a fight. That's all. I, I'm more interested in Brucalian. So, obviously, Brucalian is this uh, Fenner's own weapon, right? So, he's extremely good with his sword. He's extremely honorable and very, very smart. Do you realize that all three of them, in their own way, are extremely smart? And, uh, you know, this is like... Uh, you know, it, they're all highly com- competent. You don't have any uh, weaklings here. So, uh, the one scene which obviously would have stood out to everyone 
is the scene with the uh, herald of hood with getol who offers him uh, escape from kapustan before it can fall you know just uh, switch over your worship from fener to hood and you'll all be safe and <laughs> brukalian doesn't even consider it in fact he uh, you know he mutilates getol and kicks him out right so it just goes to show that he's extremely honorable and obviously his death do you want me to touch upon the death right uh, away whatever you like brukalian's death mind. because that was yeah no uh, as i have uh, you know i have nothing negative to say about that because for one he knows he was betrayed and if you see the thing uh, even when they realize that the the reeve has been invoked right i think rat fener has invoked a particular reeve which says that the whole company has to come and stand in protection for him and this is a reeve which they can't deny so even though he knows he is uh, going to be betrayed and this is not not right that the rat fener does not need his protection he still has to he feels compelled to follow that order uh, because you know as he says this order is bigger than the priest himself right so it's something like if people start interpreting the orders it's going to uh, I will, let's just stick to memories of ice because you know these things happen so once the order is start, uh, you know if start people start questioning the order and they start you know looking for the reason behind an order then it no longer becomes like a religious establishment with a strict hierarchy right as much as i say that we do not accept blind obedience that's basically what brucalian does here because they have invoked a reeve and he's not going to question the reeve because further down the line it should never come up that he disobeyed a reeve or a reeve is not something that has to be 100% it can you know you can take it or you can leave it that's not the type of attitude they want towards the reeve so that's probably the main reason he he walked up to the thrall and you know get brutally brutally murdered that that page was horrible to read so him and nilbanas and i think some 400 grey swords they get slaughtered in front of the thrall and uh, the thing which most stood out to me among all those things is the level of trust they have especially brucalian towards itcovian it just goes without saying you know this whole book memories of ice we've seen lack of communication on all fronts from silver fox to my to between the malas and alis malas and and the what do you call broods armies and you know so many things people keep uh, miscommunicating everywhere and here you have just perfect perfect trust brucalian knows that he has to get uh, he has to walk into the trap get killed and he will be answered by itcovian without having to say anything he didn't have to convey a single word he just had to leave the recruit and go proving her innocence right i i am making sense yes yeah so that i found fascinating that at the end he just had to say that we will be answered by itcovian and <laughs> that is enough for nil banas to you know to all of them to just accept their deaths and you know uh, because who could not recruit him he comes at the end and recruits his soul i believe <laughs> which you know it is it is sort of uh, sort of odd that he comes into the battlefield and uh, takes brucalian himself so is it something more do you want to talk about i um, mean are you giving me leave to talk about <laughs> yes 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 okay. so a few things yeah, okay i mean so in regards to brucalian i generally agree because brucalian fulfills a very precise trope in fantasy of this badass veteran swords guy that kills fools and is cool and uh, what stood out to me about brucalian particularly is how effortlessly brutal he is and how much we overlook that gethelaf offers him something very okay gethel's an asshole the way he presents himself <laughs> <laughs> and then what happens is like he's not a very great guy he doesn't phrase things very well but he's and also we know that hood isn't particularly the greatest master to serve at this point but the point is his offer is genuine and it would lead to the survival of the grey swords and all 7000 of them presumably at the very least his offer did not warrant the mutilation <laughs> no uh, if i may <laughs> yeah go on Go on, go on. Fin- finish your point I'll, i'll come back to this i mean okay for one i don't think gethol even if he did if even if he did The point is we can set that to be natural state of affairs which on one hand it's malazan we've read two and a half nearly three books by now three books by the time this book and uh, you should know better but it's so effortlessly and casually brutal that it's just uh, yeah i mean in the face of uh, cannibals and um you know the dead seed and all the different ranks within the and domain and all of that i guess it's a minor thing but the thing is we overlook it so easily and just how well for one the mercenaries and for two how readily they are willing to just slaughter the tenascauri and the sierra domain and the scalites or whatever they're called scathand not scathandi doesn't matter and so a lot of the time it felt to me like brucalian was being very uh cool-headed and effortlessly cool don't get me wrong he's a very cool character but also yeah. it, on the back of my head it's like am i supposed to be rooting for this guy is this the good guy? well okay that's one thing that memories of ice does very well for me is it is it completely unties itself from any sort of moral dilemma 
it has a very clear cut between good guys and bad guys. Because on one side yeah. you have the valiant, honorable defenders of Kapustan, and on the other side of the river or the wall or whatever you like, you have the bloodthirsty, blood uh, flesh eating cannibal army. Yeah. So in that regard, there's a very clear indication of you should probably do it for this guy and not those guys. Which okay, fine. But am I really supposed to be rooting for this guy? And then the other thing is, you mentioned his death. Um, so, yeah. Rukalian essentially had to die and lean into the betrayal, precisely so that the Reeve is invoked and uh, Rathfinder's betrayal is finalized. Because if it doesn't get invoked, he just said, okay, come defend me, I demand, of, I demand of you in the name of our god. And they said no, and then they look bad. Yeah. Instead, he had to sacrifice himself, so the betrayal is concluded, which I have to question... Who actually cares? Uh, about what? So, Brokalian and probably Canales both know Fender's not here. Fender, since the okay. has been pulled down and is no longer present. They can't tell anybody because that destroys their morale, but he knows. He can feel it. And so, Fender isn't here to deliver justice to that Fender. We see that later when, you know, with Govian. Yeah. Yeah. Fender is not here. Carnandas basically all but tells Govian that his vows are personal and Fender doesn't much care about them. We learn that Fender doesn't care about. Uh, what, how do you put it? That Fener doesn't exclude arbitrary, doesn't respect arbitrary exclusions? Arbitrary exclusions, yeah. Something like that. So, who actually stands to care for Rathenet's betrayal? It Covian does, and it's a very deeply personal betrayal because, in the name of their god, that's no longer there, and they both know it. I think Rathenet also knows it. He invokes, uh, he invokes the, goddammit, he invokes the Reeve of, <laughs> yeah. you know, to defend the priest, while they know that he's not the actual high priest, because Canales is. So, I have to question, is the betrayal really necessary? Did they have to do this? And I don't know if the answer is yes. Yes, the answer is yes. They had to do it for the rest of the order. They're not going to dissolve the order just because their god is lost, right? I- I'm sure that was never the never the question. The point is, they had to carry on the reap. They had to carry on this honor and this tradition because the order would survive, regardless of how many people rem- uh, remained at the end. For that sake, for the sake of the uh, the remaining people, I think Rukalian had to do it. You said if earlier... he was the last guy standing... I don't know. Yeah, sorry. You spoke earlier about uh, communication and trust. Yeah. Everyone in the order knows that Rathfinder is not actually the Dystrians, and Carnalas is. So, in my eyes, it's a very badass moment, but it's also a bit of miscommunication, because you're not dishonoring the Reeve because the god's gone, and the priest is not actually the high priest that you're supposed to serve. You're doing this because of personal reasons, which is respectable on one hand. On the other hand, it feels a bit pointless for us. See, another thing is, even if he's not a destroyer, he's still a priest. He's still a fenest priest. You know, that carries some weightage. It doesn't matter if he's the highest uh, destroyer. I think Karnas can just dispute him, no? He can depose him if he wants to, but he doesn't. And he also, I think Karnas has a monologue where he thinks, uh, this guy is, you know, he has political ambitions and that's why he's on the mass council, which this guy, uh, Karnas is not ready to do such things. There is something like that. Yeah. So. yeah. But he's still the priest of Fenner. So, and if he wants protection, the Grey Swords are bound to protect him. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm just playing David's advocate here. I'm saying that maybe it wasn't necessary. If you think it's necessary, great. No. <laughs> I mean, yeah. This then brings us to Garnalas himself, of the Death End of the Grey Swords, the Death End of Fenna. Can I just go back to Gethol for a minute? Yes. You said you want to talk about it. Yes, go on. Yeah, the thing is, even if uh, uh, the, the offer which Gethol gave him, that, you know, you can just take all your people, 7,000 plus the other new 1,000 people, all of you just carry on, just, you know, escape the city and come out. That is not why Brucalian is there. It's it's definitely insulting to tell him that you're just a mercenary company, so you're going to lose, let's go. Because, you know, that is not their premise. And that's why that scene had to be so strong. That's why he had to overreact so much. Because he's not like any other, uh, what, what, probably the <laughs> Bold brothers might be like that. I don't know. I can't think of any other uh, mercenary companies who would bolt at the sight of defeat, right? So... The, it, it, I think all this adds to the question of honor. I mean, obviously, that scene itself is questioning their honor, right? So, mm-hmm. I think that was the overreaction there. And it's brutal, but, you know, it was necessary, I feel. No? You still don't agree? Yeah. It's not that I disagree. I just, again, I'm just pointing out alternatives. Uh, because I want to get to a greater point. But we'll get to that in a minute. So, <laughs> Karnadas. <laughs> yes, Karna- right. you say Karnadas. Yes. It, I mean, it sounds like an Indian word, so... It is, yeah. Das is a well-known second name, and Karna is also a, a proper first name. Karna Das. Okay. <laughs> However, you pronounce no, it. Anyway, I'm just going to call it the Destrian from here on. So the Destrian of the Grey Swords. The fake Destrian or the true Destrian? No, you please pronounce it the way you want to, because I, I'm sure Ericsson says it in some other way. Karna Das, probably, to spite both of us. <laughs> so anyway, Karna Das, apparently. Uh, no, no, that's just mine. You go on with yours. Okay, fine, fine. Doesn't matter. Point is. The Destriant, before I go in with my top thoughts about him, which I think 
frankly, I think the death scene is much more interesting than Brugalian. Are you, do you really think that? Yes. Because I am completely confused by him. He's just a priest. He heals everyone and that's it. I <laughs> I don't really care about him and I don't know what his role is or, you know. So, How do you find him interesting? Please tell me. There is a scene in the Thrall with the Mass Council hmm. where Rathfinder essentially says, I think we've talked about this before, that he ventured to the reedy fields oh, whatever yeah. <laughs> and I found a god and I stayed with him for like three days or something. And kind of just nods along. Like, yeah, yeah, congratulations, very good. And then Ikovian questions him about this, and he just responds, well, yeah, he quested all the way over there, and then came back. <laughs> I never left. Yeah. <laughs> so, Karnadas is basically the manifestation of Fender's will, and mm. he's in constant... Well, constant. Fender's gone, he's not there, so <laughs> they can't exactly talk. <laughs> but insofar as he was still in his realm, Karnadas was basically in constant communication with Fenner, and he is the one that understands and knows Fender's will more than anyone else. And that shows... When he talks with Kovian, because Hedon is trying to woo him, which I'm not going to talk about. You can talk about that if you want. I am not going to. I'm sorry. Why not? Uh, Hedon tries to woo him, and I'm... it's Kovian's having a crash of faith. And then Karnas, Karnas questions him about it, and he's like, okay, what's your deal? What, what's up? And he goes, <laughs> sir, I'm questioning my faith. You know, why would that be? Well, because I think my vows are not, you know, I have uh, taken all these vows. I have chained myself to worship, and it feels like the gods don't care. Or the gods rage at me for not living my life. And I kind of says, okay, but have you sworn your vows because you think they are uh, in service of Fena? And he's like, yes. And the Destin a little bit tells him he's an idiot. The Destin basically tells him that the God doesn't care. The vows are for you personally. They are your undertaking so that your faith may be solidified. Fena doesn't care what kind of vows you take as long as you're loyal to him and you're faithful and you do as he asks. So, in that sense, also he's very powerful because no, not many people, if anyone else we see throughout the books, can extend their power to everyone else so that they may channel it through him from a distance. That's ridiculous. But that aside, he understands the will of Fender more than anyone else. He is witty. He is intelligent. He is kind. But Brukalian is very stern and very cold because of necessity. And uh, Karnadas doesn't care about that because he's just there to heal people and make them not lose their faith in Fender. And so he could unmask the priest. But as you said, he doesn't because that would get him into the political quagmire of the Mass Council, which he's never going to get out of. Now, through multiple occasions in this book, we see that the Mass Council is basically full of crap. <laughs> We see uh, Rathburn, for example, try to lift Brute's hammer and break her wrists. We see Rathfinder betray Brokalian. We see Keruli show up and just like, okay, I'm going to be Rath cruel now because I said so. Because I'm actually cruel, but whatever. But Karnadas is the only person that doesn't actually take direct action against that. Brute, obviously, is in a very, you know, <laughs> yeah, a very obvious display of why you are actually not the will of Burn. And you yeah. don't know what you're talking about. Similarly, uh, but Karnadas doesn't do that because he very well could. He says he could. He knows he could. But he doesn't, because politics are less important than Fenner. And he understands this, and he knows this. And so, his suit saying of Itkovian, and his supportive attitude, and the fact that he doesn't need to be like this big badass guy that knows everything, because it's not his job. Itkovian is the scholar in this, not Karnadas. Karnadas is the priest. It's very endearing to see a priest that's not full of themselves. Or cynical, like Havoric. God damn it, man. <laughs> no, Havoric you can't compare, because, you know, he had a rich history of being a thief and historian and all that, right? He was not just a priest like Karnadas. We don't know what Karnadas was before, do we? I assume he was born a priest. And How are you born a priest? <laughs> I don't know. We don't get any background. That's what I'm saying. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to add about uh, our testing before we get to the start of the show? No, I think we get move on. Okay, be like that. <laughs> oh, sorry, what do you want me to add? <laughs> I mean, we're talking about Covid next, so uh, please... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, so Itkovian, where do I begin? Maybe we can begin with his childhood. So he was born in Ellingar. What What's his full name? Uh, Tonthalian. Itkovian Tonthalian. Oh, Tonthalian. Yeah, so he didn't have a happy childhood, right? So Itkovian or Tonthalian. So we find that he doesn't have a happy childhood. And uh, I, I sort of don't remember the details. Do you want to tell me what happens so, when he's a child? He's a child and um, his mother never smiled. Yeah. And it's implied that his father was abusive. And whatnot, and then one day, Itkovian was training up to be part of the monastic order, and then the Greysorts took him in. And his last memory of his mother is, him, is her smiling at him because he left the uh, home and the establishment. And since then, he's, a, he's basically dedicated himself to the worship and the uh, Fena and being shield anvil and all the necessities and responsibilities that Roland Dales. So yeah, Itkovian being the shield anvil. Can I just tell you one minute that you know the image of a shield anvil is something really cool for me? 
because as you know our shields are just something that are meant to be broken right i mean you pound them hard enough they're going to break they're just layers of leather and some metal but whereas an anvil is something that is not meant to break right so you hold up an anvil as a shield it just the the whole image of it is you know extremely nice so that's what ikovian is he does not break he can take up all the grief possible he can you know deliver every soul within kapustan i think that's where he begins right as soon after the slaughter he takes upon all the uh, souls which did not reach out and with that he reaches the parley at uh, what's that place outside kapustan so and that's when you know he finds out that he still has a purpose because i think that whole journey it goes on with uh, a lot of self doubt right he keeps wondering what is his role because the grace words have been delivered they have new recruits among the tennis gauri and there is a new uh, shield and will there's a new mortal sword and all that no yeah a mortal sword comes later but yeah destroyer and uh, shield and will so he's made everything ready for them and so he wonders what's his purpose until he meets like you know hundreds of thousands of tilanimas and that's when he realizes his role was to uh, you know embrace their grief so that was one of the saddest things which we have read i believe in the first three books right i mean yeah i think so yeah I don't have anything groundbreaking to tell here, you know. Okay, so uh, is that, does that mean it's my turn to shatter all your hopes and dreams? Ah, uh, yeah, it's already shattered. Go on. So, uh, so that's basically what happens. Can, yes, I, go on. can I just say that, you know, uh, because just for the ep- this uh, episode's sake, I was looking up, you know, unflattering comments and uh, posts and all about it, Kovian. <laughs> and there are quite a few. There are people criticizing him for delivering the Talanimas oh, yeah. just yep. before this yep. huge yep. Uh, <laughs> battle. <laughs> and there's one more saying that you know why is he all uh, i mean he is going to be accepted into the parley regardless of what happens uh, there and still he tries to like hide behind the tent and tries to stay away from the main talk and things like that which he did not do but then i don't know it it suited his character that once he was done he accepted he's a failure and he's not going to push himself into any sort of meeting right i mean i think very specifically uh, very specifically he says uh brocalgan asked for 6 weeks i gave him 3 days Yeah. So the guy's broken. Yeah. His friends are dead. His soldier is dead. Or the past of his soldier is dead and now it's past him. His entire life has basically been his order. He has nothing else. Yeah. So I want to touch upon one more thing before if you would yeah. we'll take a break really quick. So it goes in back story is very reminiscent of um another character I think who we see in Memories of Ice and I'm trying to remember if this is I'm pretty sure it's revealed in Memories of Ice. So it's uh there is a character that shows um Mercy to talk Let's see a domain, a nameless here domain that takes talk yeah. out of the mind and embrace and then tells him a story. And then he says, uh, I was from a very young age, I was taken into the, the, the Panin domain. My mother was one of the witches in the Panin domain. My sisters and uh, joined the Tenskauri and were riding men twice their age. My brothers joined and I became a seer domain. And the only person that didn't yeah. was my father. And he remembers very fondly that his last memory of his father is him sailing away into the ocean, into nothing. and he smiles yeah. at him and wishes him the best and that is contrasted with Kovian whose last memory of his mother is her smiling at him because he escapes because he leaves and i found it very interesting personally because i fucking love Sir Domen but this stuck out to me in the last lady and um i want to bring it up before i crush your dreams and uh well no crush your dreams really i just have uh, some differing opinions that they're not just badasses like you mentioned earlier but before we get to that unless you have anything more to add i can get to it please do okay so that's basically the story of the episode so far from start in Capstan and to finish at the Coral. So, first of all, I want to talk a bit more on Brucalian, if you'd like, and yeah. the relationship in general of the Grey Sword between them. So, Brucalian is presented to us as a basically perfect leader. He is a very competent warrior. He's a mortal sword for Hawk's sake. He's a very competent warrior, a very skilled leader. He is a great diplomat, very patient. He deals primarily with the Mass Council and the Prince and whatnot. And he's also quite faithful because he... He is, after all, the mortal sword of Fenner. He is Fenner's blade and uh, whatnot. And in that, he reinforces in Edkovian the fact that his purpose lies only with these men and women, but mostly the two men beside him in the hierarchy. Karnadas does, but less so. I think Karnadas mostly offers him a way out, sort of, um, that essentially gives him an out of... Yeah, it's not just about the vows. It's not sticking to every principle that you have. It's the faith that you have inside you that matters, not... whether or not you don't have sex or whatnot. But at the end of the day, all three of them, and all 7,000 of the recruits of the Grey Swords, are all sworn to the group war. They are a military organization first, a religious organization second, and that changes depending on the situation. 
but it's not a very far behind second. It's a very close second, and sometimes can overtake the first. Sometimes they need to act in their uh, in their capacity as a religious organization, not a military company. So it stands to reason to question of what do these people worship? Why? Well, I think you may know that Fenner by now is the god of war, the boar of summer, the whatever he is. Okay, war is his only subject, but it is the primary reason people worship him, and we've seen other uh, initiates in the worship of Fenner in Protocol Haboric, and also Gessler, Storm and Truth, Stormy and Truth from Deathhouse Gate. What do all these people have in common? Except for Haboric, they're all basically soldiers. They worship war. They worship uh, as, I think Kogan puts it, there is fire of battle in Fenner's veins, which Hedan <laughs> then says is the fire of lust. But yeah. the point is, these people, these men and women essentially worship war. And not just war in the fact that, you know, what the Malazans have as a preconceived notion of war, with rules and treatment for prisoners of war, and no torture will ever be countenanced, and um, a strict a strict hierarchy, but not a rigid structure where each like soldier can think and whatnot. These guys are honor-bound, oath-bound to a god that is strictly um, aspected to war. Yeah. I don't think that's a good thing. <laughs> you may agree. I don't know if you'll agree. See. <laughs> I hope you're okay. I, uh, you know, can I just say, uh, if you're going to have, I, I'm not going to take a moral stance here, right? Because the gods exist in this world, mm-hmm. and gods of war exist who demand their worshippers, you know, wage war in their name and things like that. So uh, let, let's not even correlate it with what we have here. It doesn't matter. So there is a god of war. People worship them, and people wage wars against them, right? All I'm thinking is, as a mercenary company, if they are this religious, if they are, you know, this honor bound to their God and their faith, wouldn't they be perfect to be hired? <laughs> you know, this sentiment comes up again and again yes. in, Mal- in both Ericsson and Camp's books that soldiers fight not just for themselves, but the person next to them. So if it is a tightly bound, a, a single, a, a whole religious order which fights as one unit, aren't they like really perfect? Because each one of them is, you know, 100% dedicated to this war. So they're bound to succeed. They're going to be good. And that, that's the thing I'm thinking. But are they good? Are they bad? I know this is not a question which I mean, I'm not sure we should be asking it because, you know, these things exist here, right? And once uh, Fenner is out, we get a new god of war. We get two more new gods of wars, right? The Tog and Fandere and all that. So uh, I'm not sure what exactly, uh, you know, you want to condemn here. I'm not trying to condemn anything. I'm just saying <laughs> war is not generally something you should like. Moreover, all of the gods of war we've seen so far, Fenner, Tog, Fandere, Drake, they're all beasts. They're all yeah, beasts. They're yeah. animalistic. They don't... Con- they don't... There is no humanity? Is yes, that what you want to say? They, they don't subscribe to our notions of what war is. Because for them, many of the beasts that, for instance, uh, humans worship, they view what they do as hunt. They're not gods of the hunt. Sure. They're gods of war. Of war. So by viewing uh, war as a hunt, you intrinsically dehumanize your opponent, which is kind of necessary for battle, yeah, yeah. but it's also not morally good. And it's fine if they do it in the heat of the moment, but when they worship that notion is when it becomes problematic. Now, again, I've said this before, I'll say it again. We have a very narrow scope of morality in Memories of Ice because there's very clear cut lines of good guys and bad guys, and the, mem- and the great swords fall flat on the side of the good guys. However, they are also attracted almost entirely to war, and when they lose, because that's what happens, Kabustan is liberated, they don't fall to Kabustan, but most of them die, and they have to recruit among fallen enemies. And as you said, it goes goes to visit some Barkast witches to tell him that he's no longer sealed anvil because your god's gone, and the new gods have taken their place, place or are about to. And you need to choose a new sealed anvil, and a new destriant, and a new mortal sword has already been chosen for you. And so he chooses Valbara and Narul, I think, among yeah, true, true. the company to become Valbara is a sealed anvil, Narul is the destriant. I think. No, 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 other way around. Yeah, I, I keep getting confused between the two. No, I, I, I can't. Valvara that the clues, the Kapanar clues that we say in the book is the Desert. So it Kogan is now purposeless because he is sworn to a god that is no longer there. His vows have been rendered useless by Ganaras because he figured that, oh, I have my faith, I read the vows, but these vows have defined me all my life, so what am I without them? Yeah. He, to his eyes, has failed. He is purposeless. And what is the purpose he finds, Mora? The purpose he finds yes. with the Tlanimas. He finds that they, here there are some people who have been suffering for, what, 300,000 years? And they're the one who can release them, Silver Fox, is not ready to release them because she has some other goals. Hold a thought. Which, you know, 
Huh, sorry? Hold that thought. What are the <laughs> Tlanimas? <laughs> the Tlanimas. They are the, what do you call The uh, precursors of modern humans. No, no, no. no. Who what have, what uh, is the role here? What are they doing? I'm, I'm coming to, sorry. Yeah, here. Yes. They have been called to fight the, uh, you know, the undead Kachans. I'm not going to say that. The undead kill hunters. Yes. Yeah. They are coming. So I know the su- point you're going to make. I'm not going to help you make that point. They are summoned <laughs> to do battle. Yeah. They are called to war. And it's Kovian, the man who was sworn to the god of war, the man who had to lose a battle, his closest friends, his allies, his faith, finds purpose in releasing a, ho- a host of however many thousand warriors that have suffered for 300,000 years because of endless war, because they swore themselves into this because of a war. <laughs> he releases them at the cost of his own life to peace so they don't have to fight this final war. And that is the culmination of the story of the Grey Swords, at least the three guys were following, <laughs> because the order still exists under different leadership and they're now sworn different gods. But the three Fender boys, their story culminates, yeah. two deaths in Capistan and one death in Coral. And that death in Coral is for something that was entirely against what they originally believed in. Yeah. So, in retrospect, can we judge the uh, the Mortal Sword and the Destry and the Shield Anvil on all the recruits, all the disciples as you call them, negatively because they are sworn to go to war? Depends. For Ed Kofi, I'd say probably not, because that is the only thing he knows from basically childhood. And for the others, we don't get a lot of backstory to understand. However, we can also understand that none of them are out here doing what they're doing because of uh, personal reasons. They don't care about glory. They don't much care about money. Well, some do. They're mercenaries after all. But they're all greedy. No, they are. They they take in a lot of money. You know, that's quite that's established very well. Yes, because they're very good at the job. Yeah. So the, there is a concept of money here. It's like they're not just fighting wars just because you know a war exists. Like yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. I think. I think the you're viewing it in the opposite way. I think they are a mercenary company precisely because they are sworn to war. Yeah. And so being a mercenary is their way of achieving their goals in order to wage war. But that aside, the point is they're not financially motivated. They don't stay in Capistan because of money. Because the guy that's supposed to give them the money is dead. <laughs> so you they, know. they could have got an advance, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. it does not take the fact that we cannot judge them negatively for it. And we view them in a positive light does not take away from the fact that they are sworn to better of war. They are doing what they're doing because of a god's order. They are acting on a god's order and they're not thinking about it. We've been told repeatedly from Tuvika, mostly, in the house gates, that a Malathan soldier is dangerous because they're allowed, they're allowed to think. The Grey Swords, yeah. intrinsically, by definition, are not allowed to think beyond we're doing this because of Fena. They don't have a higher goal. They don't have a higher standard. They're doing what they're doing because, well, war. Because it's their calling, because it's what they do. And I don't know if we can empathize and call these people the good guys. But you know. They're so polite. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, but then, that that makes it... No, uh, see, oh, yeah, I lost my point. Uh, we were talking about... They're very polite. That's what you said. No, they. I, w- I was agreeing with your point that, you know, they're, they're doing this, you know, becoming a mercenary company just so that they can keep fighting wars. But then, I think that's part of their, uh, you know, that's why they cost so much money because... Once they, uh, I, I, do you, uh, you do remember the internal monologue of Brukalian at multiple places? He keeps wondering about the honor of the contract that he has. Like, at what point can he say that the contract has failed? Once the walls are overrun, or once the prince is dead, or you know, at what point can he say that my company has been, uh, you know, uh, uh, can come out of the contract? At what point? So I think it is a sort of like a you know fight to the death type of a mercenary company, even if it's not made obvious. I think, don't you think so? And, you know, that's probably the appeal of being a religious order. I mean, I don't think that contradicts anything. I think, if nothing else, it further illustrates the point that they're fanatics. That they're doing this because that's what their god wants. And so, if our god wants us to stay and fight to the death, because that's what's honorable, they'll do it. With little sense of self-preservation. And we romanticize that and idolize that for good reason, because it's a good thing to do, generally. But it's not one or two or three people. It's like 7,000, 8,000 yeah. with the government recruits. Yeah, it's a yeah. lot of people, men and women, that die because fanaticism. That's only yeah. taking in the Great Souls, not even considering the Tenescauri and all the panning groups, but the casualties were told are massive. Yeah, but then at the end, you know, most of them die, right? But yeah, I agree with your point. But I still like them because they're cool. <laughs> okay, you, you, can, you can say that. I don't, <laughs> I don't mind. I'm not going to complain. Yeah. Do you know uh, another organization that came up in Elingarth? Do you remember? Which other organization do we see? Uh, the Trigal? Yes. So, you know, I think that was interesting because even they cost a lot of money mm-hmm. and they don't have any uh, any qualms in, you know, 
dying just to make the delivery. But they are not religious. So, you know, I thought it was interesting that this one city, Elingarth, has given rise to both Grace Woods and the Trigal. Is it Trigal? Eh? Uh, yes. Fine. Yeah, so both of these extremely uh, expensive organizations which are highly dedicated to their jobs. So, I thought that was interesting. I'm looking for a quote that... Um... I'm trying to rem- I seem to recall a quote that's like, I think it's Dujek and uh, Brood talking about how the Malazans would have tried to conquer Elingarth, but nobody's stupid enough to try. Something like that. I don't quite remember where it's from, but like, okay. the Elin peoples generally fall into a few categories. There are either merchants like the Regal, there's uh, religious orders, and there's pirates. Lots of pirates. <laughs> the entire southern end of Genovacus. It's mentioned that uh, most kingdoms south, uh, to the south and east of uh, Elingarth on the, ta- on the tip of Chinabagis are all basically pirate confederations. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter, but the point is the Elin peoples in general are highly regimented, and which explains why they're all part of a uh, religious order, right? So, is there anything else you'd like to say about, the in general, the, uh, the Grey Sword? I'm not sure if I have any more points to make, or if we'd like, if we'd want to touch upon Mitkovian a bit more, if you want. I don't know. Because we skipped over Hatan, and I feel like you want to talk about that more. Right, uh, yeah. This thing, can I talk about the prologue? Because okay. for one, yes. Memories of Ice prologue has something amazing. It's, yes. it's extremely well written. So, I was looking at, uh, I'm going to call him Krul. Okay? So, uh, once, uh, when Krul passes through uh, this continent which has been destroyed by Kalar, and he looks at all the people who are suffering there, who, you know, the few survivors there who are basically eating each other and all that, mm-hmm. he says that he walks as if gathering suffering unto himself. And, you know, uh, even though he suffers, he's trying to take the suffering of all the people, but he's not embracing their broken souls because he still is trying to feed on the blood, right? So he's an elder god. He feeds on the blood for his power. So he's not taking their souls, but he's able to absorb some of their suffering. And I think through the book, we do see some part of uh, Krul becoming very compassionate, right? So I was just thinking that from the prologue, uh, especially given this type of phrasing, there must have been some correlation between Krul and Itkovian as, you know, as a precursor of the type of shield anvil that Itkovian becomes. I thought it was just a nice uh, comparison between them. I was trying to stretch it to become, you know, Draconis as the modern sword and all that, but yeah, that's too much of a stretch, so I'm not doing that. <laughs> you had something to tell about? I think saying Krul would embrace souls and uh, stuff like that, it's just, it's complicated. Because, for one, we know very little about the Elder Gods in the Prologue of Ice. One, two... Um, Krul is very different then than he is now. We see him clearly as a merchant with Guntel and then goes to the and talks to people. He's very different there when compared to the god walking through and like taking up the blood and the suffering that's spilled in his. And his in the monologue says a lot about how strong he is because of how much blood has been shed in his name and um, artists have been shed in blood and um, even the Belfry in Belfry. Belfry? <laughs> I you know, know, I don't th- that thing, the temple in Darajistan, even that <laughs> has a dark past of blood sacrifice and stuff in the name of Krul. And that is how most elder gods get their power, by blood, basically. Which is why, incidentally, Krul's blood is the sort of the one. So, Krul then and Krul now are very different, partially because of uh, Kairos curse, which said he would be forgotten and whatnot, and also partially because 120,000 years have gone by, so obviously he's a bit different. Uh, I think... To say that he's the dead, uh, shield anvil, and he would take on the souls and the major suffering and all that, you can stretch it, sort of. Yeah. To be fair, Krul, even by memory device, is the maker of paths by then. Yeah. So, yeah. Warrens exist. He even takes on a whole continent into his Warrens because, you know. So, he clearly has some symbols of compassion, but he says to himself, Elder gods embody a host of harsh unpleasantries. I think it's the exact phrase. Yeah, yeah. It's considerably different. I guess you could say there's precedent in that he's taking souls, but Itkovian is different. And also, they're all gods. So, you know, to call, to call Draconis a mortal sword when he's a god is a bit, you know. <laughs> I know, yeah. yeah I, I didn't try to go there. But However, I think we discussed this earlier, there is precedent about Destriants. There is an epigraph in MOI that says that a certain cut person, Unta, that had been ritually had his hands ritually severed when he shouldn't have was destined to be the next Estriant and um, of Fena. And um, I think you can maybe, especially because of what Krul does in this book, you can maybe view Krupp from the first book as a Destriant, a quasi Destriant, because not exactly, he's not exactly a Destriant, almost a Destriant to Krul. He speaks to him through dreams. Yeah. It's more like Krul invades Krupp's dreams rather than the opposite. But 
whatever. He's in very close contact. He and then Krul manifests, right? He manifests in the flesh and goes to meet people. While Krap is also in, on the field and manipulating things as they heal. So you can technically, maybe, possibly, view Krap as the destiny to Krul. It's a bit of a stretch, I guess, but he ticks some of the boxes, not all of them. Yeah, I mean, if Krul had a destiny on the model plane now, after his recur- uh, resurrection, that has to be Krap. I don't think there's any doubt there. You know, I don't think you're stretching it. Yeah. And do you really think that Kra- Krul uh, like invaded Krupp's dreams? I thought it was more like Krupp gave him the dream world, you know, so that the god can come in and then all, you know, all the other things start happening. I think Krupp is often surprised that, yeah, I think Krupp is often surprised that people can walk into his dreams. But it's more like oh. he acts surprised, like, oh, you're here as well? Yeah. I, am, I am shocked. Shocked, I tell you. <laughs> but I don't think, yeah, I think it mostly allows Krupp to come in. Krul, Krupp, whatever. Krul. Krul. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. How dare you? Krull, Krull doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, go on. Okay, 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 sorry. No, I think we uh, diverged a bit from the discussion about Grey Sword. Because we're done talking about the Grey Swords. Because we're done talking about them and we should probably wrap up the episode. So, if you have anything more to add about how much you love Rukalian and how much you <laughs> treasure Utopian and how little you care about Karnaras, <laughs> I'm more than willing to listen. <laughs> this is unworthy, sir. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say that, you know, the Fenner boys have now become the Fenner girls, but they're not Fenner anymore. So yeah, they're on, um, yeah. What do you call them? Maybe you can say Fandere girls. I don't know. Excellent. So, so, you can wind up? Well, I think, looking back at each of them, we have Brukalian, who has a very interesting arc in his own right, you know. Glorious leader, diplomat, mortal sword, slices Gethel's face, Gethel's face open, kills a whole bunch of Tenescaure, honors his vows and his faith, and goes to die like a hero. Itkovian, who loses his faith and whatnot, and then gives his life to Mrs. Lenoir's. And then you have Kardaras, who dies like an old man, and it feels very heart-wrenching to see him like that. No, that was sad, because, you know, uh, at least Brukalian went out in such a such a badass fashion, and that Kardaras just, you know, he just withers away. He just droops down and dies. Am I mistaken, or does he tell him that he's done? He does, he does. I am done, sir. And Nitkovin replies, I am not. And then, you know, he strokes his hair or something, and it's very, very touching. It's very sad. Hair as in, he's pretty bald actually, Karnadas, because he has, you know, done too much healing for all the people yes. there. Especially at Kogin. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, do you think, you know, at, uh, when people read Memories of Ice for the first time, we don't really understand what happens with Rathfender, that whole scene. Yes. Of uh, cutting his hands. Yes. And then immediately absorbing his grief. Do, do you have, so I'm sure you have things to talk about there. So, I kind of dodged around this question and this topic that uh, Itkovian is Why? very much a Jesus figure. You know, he sacrifices himself to take the pain of others and uh, stuff. And, you know, but to get to the point. So, Rathfender has committed the crime. He has yes. betrayed the Reeve. He has betrayed his god. And he must be punished in accordance to defend the Reeve, which dictates that the ritualistic punishment that they deliver, as we've seen from Herboric, is the ritualistic severment of their hands. So their hands may be delivered to their god. And then when the god sees their soul after they die, they can be, you know, atoned and whatnot. When that happened to Herboric, Fender was there, it was fine. You know, he took his hands, which indirectly led to Haboric having the ability to pull Fender down, but it doesn't matter. The point is, Fender took Haboric's hands. Now, Fender's not here anymore. Itkovian knows this, Ganos knows this, Norul probably knows this, and I'm sure uh, Rathfender also knows this. So, it's not a good idea what Itkovian's about to do. And at first glance, it looks super cruel, because <laughs> see what happens to him right after, right? So they chop off his hands, and rather than the... The god of the poor summer taking his hands, something else does. And then they see, you know, green stuff and like writhing flesh and boiling stuff. It, it, it's horrendous. It's very painful. It's very torturous. And because something that is not Fenner has taken uh, Rathfenner's hands and, you know, and has laid claim to his yeah. soul through his hands, right? That's one thing. So what Kevin does is he's finished with that and then he steps aside. And then I think the first person that realizes what he's about to do is Ganos. That tells him what you're about to do is going to kill you. And then Narul te- uh, tells... Uh, captain, yeah, it's a captain. Itkovian tells Captain Narul to basically, if she tries to stop me, kill him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then he steps forward to uh, Rathfenner and takes him in his hands, embraces him and says, do you accept my embrace? And Rathfenner at the end says, no, because if you embrace me, you're going to die. And in that moment, Itkovian notices that, sees all of his past. He sees Rathfenner's past, his memories, his pain. Sees yeah. the decisions, the political maneuvers, the scheming that led to his betrayal of Fenner and the betrayal of Pagalian. And he understands that his rejection of his embrace is the priest's way to atone. And so he concludes that he has atoned enough and he has suffered enough and, and eventually decides to take on his pain. 
and to free him and let him die in peace. And he does. And then that thing that has laid claim to uh, the priest's soul fights Govian over it. And rather than backing away, it Govian leans into it and tries to embrace yeah. it as well. And then, uh, like, okay, is it a spoiler? Do we know who that is? Who tried to lay claim? Can I just say the exact phrasing? You know what it says Yes, here? go on. It just says, uh, the alien presence recoiled, but it was too late. It Covian's embrace offered its immeasurable gift and was engulfed. He felt his soul dissolving, tearing apart, too vast. So, I then the sensation was gone, you know. Uh, fleeing him as the alien god succeeded in extracting itself, leaving it Covian with but fading echoes of a distant world's grief. A world with its own atrocities layer upon layer through a long tortured history. Fading, then gone. So, all we know is this is an alien god which has a lot of pain. And the pain was so vast that Ikovian would have crumbled right there. But somehow, this alien presence extracted itself and, you know, uh, left him alone. So, I, I don't think we need to go further than this. I'm sure people can put this together. Yeah. So, I think that's uh, my... Fl- now, if you ask how does the embracing thing work... Dude, look, Christian theology has been debating this for 2,000 years. <laughs> if they don't have an answer, I don't have an answer either. I don't know how this works. <laughs> I don't know how Ikovian embraces people. So, he does because magic. And daily stuff. Yeah. No, because it was not clear. When I read it for the first time, I really did not understand anything that happened with Rathfener. So, it was only the reread which, you know, it made so much sense. So, I thought we can, you know, just explain what's going on there. So, I think um, the last thing we need to touch upon with Gobian is Anaster, the first child of the Dead Seed, Anaster. Anaster. Dr. Yeah, Anaster. Of course, we pronounce Anaster. Why not? Why can we not pronounce it? Okay, you know what? Fine. Anaster. What, what do you want to. What? I call it Anaster with, uh, you know. Yeah, I'm not going to judge you. Why do? You, why are you judging the way I'm? No, no, no. Things? It's just like I'm not judging you. I'm just saying we pronounce everything differently somehow. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> see, we are having trouble with proper English words yeah. like belfry. So True. <laughs> it's not our first language. If you do a Greek podcast or if I do a Tamil podcast, it's going to be different, right? But then I'm pretty bad at Tamil. So, so yeah. Um, what are we talking about? <laughs> uh, Anastel. Yes. <laughs> uh, Itkovian really doesn't have much to do with Anastel. He just sees him. And realizes that this guy is like a shell. He doesn't have anything except despair. And leaves him alone. And it's the other one. He doesn't just leave him alone. He, he sees him in the thrall with, uh, while they're feasting. With, Not thrall, in the palace. Or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, okay. The captain palace of the prince, whatever. Because he was eating the prince. Because, it's an yes, important scene. Yes, yes. And then what does he do? He says like, okay, come embrace me. And then Anastasia is like, no, <laughs> he no. Doesn't say- yeah, wait, he doesn't say Okay, he doesn't say that way. <laughs> but that's what he says. Like, he, like they said to him the one, like, come on, come here. Let me embrace you. <laughs> because he doesn't want to kill him. If he can. You... <laughs> okay, tell me, how, how does the scene go? Fine. I'm sorry. It's just, you know, it's very flirty sounding when you say this. That's why I think Ericsson added sir everywhere. I'm sorry, I'm going to shut up. Yeah, please go on. That's my take on things anyway. And then Nerul actually embraces him. We see what happens to him because he's such a husk. That he's virtually not a person anymore. So he can just be inhabited by Tok's soul and he becomes Tok and Asta, right? More than sort of Tog. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, since the Great Swords and Valvara and all of those are still, you know, under the new leadership of Talk, they are still active as a member of Ice. I think this about wraps up our discussion, at least without getting the further spoilers about books that we haven't touched upon yet. So yeah. I will say I will stop judging Rukalin if you accept the Karnadas as a game. <laughs> okay, I like I like Karnadas. No, I like this one. See, Karnadas was not bad, but you know he was overshadowed by the other two. Huge characters. Be that way. Right? Fine. Yeah. No, yeah, I think that's it. I think I don't have anything more to say. I'm kind of just rambling now. Do you think this is a good place to start? Uh, sure. Right. So, thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed. If you have any, please give us a some feedback. You can find us on Twitter and Reddit. The links will be on the description, hopefully. More I will put them there. I'm sure. <laughs> have a great rest of your day, and thank you for sticking through. Goodbye. Bye.